because what you don't know about energy can kill you. Here's Alex Epstein. Welcome to Power Hour. I'm Alex Epstein. Uh, I'm recording a special episode today. Uh, by the time you see this, this will have happened unless something really bad happens to me or I get screwed over. Uh, but I'm testifying in front of Congress on Wednesday and the subject has to do with Puerto Rico. And I am very, uh, basically they're trying to shut down reliable electricity in Puerto Rico, which is the exact opposite of what they need. Uh, but you know, I wanted to get some broader context on Puerto Rico and particularly what can be made a lot better because you know, a lot of pe rich people are moving there. It's nice in a lot of ways, but it's also a really poor uh, place. And I feel like you know, by talking about shutting down reliable power, that's like the worst thing they could be talking about. And it made me more interested in, okay, what are the broader things that could be done to improve Puerto Rico. So I messaged uh, my old boss, Euron Brook of the Ayn Rand Institute and the Euron Brook Show, who is an expert in this, both because he knows a lot about human progress and because he lives in Puerto Rico. So I'm sure has studied it extensively. And he said he had done this great talk on it, but that I couldn't access it because they had some recording error, which I'm very sympathetic to. So I figured, all right, I would interview him and I would get this great talk and knowledge for me and also for you guys. So Euron, welcome back to Power Hour. Thanks for having me on, Alex. All right, so let's start off with let's start off with your uh, story and kind of the best of Puerto Rico. So, why did you move to Puerto Rico? And I, I, you know, you used to live in California, fairly near where I live. You know, different people live like they do, like six months on, six months off. And I know now you're basically permanently there. So, tell us about like what is good about Puerto Rico that's causing people to go there. So first, it's a beautiful place. It's a, it's a tropical island in the middle of the Caribbean. Uh, the weather is amazing. I mean, you, you have to suffer uh, the humidity, but uh, other than that, it never gets too hot. It, it never gets cold, it never goes below 70, it never goes above 90. There's always an ocean breeze. So, so the weather is perfect. You can get uh, oceanside property, uh, you, you know, at least uh, a year ago, you could get oceanside property. At relatively uh, low valuations, uh, particularly coming from California, where, where prices uh, are very, very high. But even as compared to Miami, you can get something similar right on the ocean at half to a third of the cost of what it would cost you uh, in Miami. And then Puerto Rico, I think it was 2012, instituted a, um, a tax regime that basically favors people coming from the United States to Puerto Rico in certain industries uh, that basically provide services outside of Puerto Rico. So if you're a service provider and you provide services in the United States, so the money comes in to you from the United States um, and you set up a corporation in Puerto Rico, that corporation pays 4% corporate tax. Mm. We'll get to what corporate taxes are in Puerto Rico generally in a minute, but that you pay 4% corporate tax. And dividend income, so what, what the owner of the corporation withdraws from that corporation is taxed at zero. Um, and all capital gains uh, are taxed at zero. So your effective tax rate from a business like this, particularly if you get some of your income in the form of capital gains, is less than 4%. Now, going from a regime in California where I was paying 54 55% all in, federal, state, Social Security, Medicare, to regime when paying around 4% is that's pretty amazing. Uh, and now you pay, you have to pay yourself a salary. So there is some social security and, and Medicare, but, but overall the tax comes down dramatically. Um, so it's this uh, tax benefit that is attracting a lot of people, uh, particularly people in uh, finance, uh, in, in computers who are serving as consultants who can structure their life as a for, so consultants. This is, from a tax perspective, this is the ideal place. If you do the work in Puerto Rico, but you're consulting elsewhere, uh, you, you know your tax rate drops significantly. So, I think it's the it's a quality of life in terms of weather. The people are cre incredibly friendly. The food is amazing. There are really good restaurants here. Um, you can get great property, and you pay very little taxes. Um, and then, if you add to that from a business perspective close to the East Coast, so it's easier to get to New York from here than it is from California. It's closer to Europe, um, Puerto Rico, at least before COVID, had some really good flights into Europe, so it was easy to travel out of here. Miami's a hub, you can go to Latin America pretty easily. The package, given my lifestyle, which um, I travel a lot, 
So uh, for this to be a hub where I spend uh, something over six months, but I travel the rest of the time uh, was, was a perfect choice for my lifestyle. All right. So when you, when you hear these kinds of accounts, you just think, oh, well, this is like another wealthy place. This is just like a really prosperous uh, island and we should all move there. And probably it has, you know, GDP comparable to the U.S. So like, what's the actual situation? Like what, you know, what's the relationship between what you're experiencing and what mo- much of the island experiences? I mean, this is a real tragedy and it's, and it's truly sad. And, and I've talked about this here in Puerto Rico about the I, I, I think to some extent what's going on is, a, is a, there's a massive injustice going on here because the experience is completely different if you're Puerto Rican. Um, Puerto Rico, if it was a state in the United States, would be the poorest state in the U.S. It's poorer on a per capita GDP than Mississippi. Is it um, a considerably poorer? It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's somewhere like 26,000 GDP per capita, whereas pretty much every state in the U.S. is well over 30. Um, so it's, it's considerably poorer than the poorest state in, in the United States. It has the highest corporate taxes among the highest corporate taxes in the world. I think it's number three in the world. Uh, corporate taxes for regular corporations in Puerto Rico not benefiting from these special acts uh, are, um, you know, around 40%. Uh, oh, I didn't mention earlier that part of this deal is Puerto Ricans don't pay federal taxes. So I don't pay federal taxes. So the 4% rate is truly all in. Um, So Puerto Rican corporations don't pay federal taxes, but they pay 40% to the state of Puerto Rico. Um, Local taxes are high. Uh, I pay 4%, but local Puerto Ricans out there. And when I pay pay myself wages, I'm paying 30 plus percent uh, income tax that is paid uh, to Puerto Rico in spite of all those high taxes or we understand that because maybe all of those high taxes, um, the infrastructure is horrific. We'll get to electricity in a minute, but but uh, there are more potholes here. Um, uh, it, you know, in this tiny little island, everywhere is a pothole. I mean, it's just, and some of them are massive. I mean, you 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 fear for your life uh, driving in some of these little roads. So uh, the first thing was you have to get an SUV, otherwise you're going to destroy the car uh, as you as you navigate the potholes. Um, but the rest of the infrastructure is very questionable. Electricity, when we came here, we were basically told, expect a power outage about once a day. Once a day. Yes, once a day. Um, and so any expensive building, like the condo building I live in, has a power generator. So the, 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 And you know, you notice the electricity goes off a second, the generator kicks in, and the electricity is back. But 90% of Puerto Ricans don't live in homes with generators. And will it just I assume it's a out. diesel generator, right? It's a big, massive, for, for our condo building, massive diesel generator. Absolutely. Reliable energy. Um, and of course, after Maria, diesel was very hard to get. So when, when the electric power completely went out on the island, uh, which it did after Maria for months, um, in this building, they only ran the diesel uh, generator at night when people came back from work. So, and they, uh, so the elevators weren't running during the day, no air conditioning during the day. And But this is the condition under which Puerto Ricans were living for months and months and months with no generator. I, I mean, and, and it can get, particularly inland, it can get hot, it's very humid, it's very, very unpleasant. So the infrastructure is terrible. Uh, there is massive corruption on the island. That is, the, the government here is uh, is unbelievably corrupt. It's unbelievably inefficient. Uh, go back to the electricity issue. The, the electric grid is a disaster. The power generation facilities break down constantly. The fires, the explosions, unexplained explosions, all kinds of things happening that make uh, even reliable energy unreliable in Puerto Rico. Um, but... The, the, the corporate headquarters of the state-owned electric company in Puerto Rico are some of the nicest buildings in all of Puerto Rico. I, I mean, they're beautiful. They're, they're not far from where I live. They're gorgeous. You drive, wow, wow, what, what is this? Uh, and it turns out that it's, it's uh, people. Now, in the last few weeks, um, th- this has been uh, sold to a private company. So now power distribution in the island is private, in quotes. I'm sure it's heavily, heavily regulated, uh, but but the whole system as a bulk was was 
uh, uh, was privatized. But you is could that, go on and on. Is you know, that Luma, the people. Luma, who Luma it? is the new company. It's a and new. What was the old one? Pipa, I think. Purpa or Pipa or something. Like Purpa, that. Purpa. You know, I, I, we could look it up easily, but got it. Uh, okay, okay. That, I'm just the I'm Puerto sorry. Rican yeah. something power authority. I think gotcha. so. Purpa. Gotcha. Uh, uh, so, um, you know, so you've got you've got uh, massive inefficiencies, you've got a very, very large government section sector, right? So here's the statistics, a third of all employed people on the island and unemployment is fairly high, but all employed people on the island, a third of them work for the government. Uh, so you've got a massive government sector that is massively inefficient. So to get to, you know, DMV, even in California is horrible, right? I mean, we all dread going to the DMV. Um, DMV in Puerto Rico is much worse, right? So in Puerto Rico, you have a little bit of money, you hire somebody to stand in line for you. They call you up when uh, you're 50 I, I actually minutes do that away. in California. You do that in California, so good for you. But in, in Puerto Rico, it's a lot cheaper to do that. But it, it's just a sign of, that's just accepted. They are these services. Uh, that provide you with, if you want to deal with the government, you call somebody and you hire somebody to deal for the government with you, for you, because there's no hope otherwise because of the bureaucracy and the inefficiency. Uh, so while you have a beautiful island, great weather, it should be as rich as Hawaii. Um, it, it, you know, some, some of the most beautiful hotels in the world are here. There's a rich cult in here that is literally, you know, world-class. Um, and yet, uh, as much as they have tourism, they're still they're still dirt poor, and uh, or not dirt poor, but they're poor certainly by U.S. standards. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's it's a tragedy, and it's uh, it's a little sad. I mean, one of the things I said in my talk was, "Look, I'm I'm actually willing to have my taxes go up wow. if if you instituted the right policies, right? If we had a flat tax in Puerto Rico just for everybody on everything of ten percent." then I'm willing to raise my taxes from four to 10% just to see that happen, right? Because it's, it is un, it, it, it's, it's unjust that Puerto Ricans are treated the way they are treated by their own government. And of course it's their fault because they, they elect these governments uh, and they elect these politicians, but that's, that's the kind of cycle we're in. With that, uh, you mentioned 26,000 GDP. Is that, do you know if that's mean or median? I don't. I don't because I would suspect it's mean, and I, I would suspect there are more wealthy people in Puerto Rico than in Mississippi. Uh, I don't know. I'm how not many sure. People I'm not sure okay. because I'm not sure because not. I mean, when you look at everything, ultimately, um, uh, not that many Americans have moved here. Okay. So while there are quite a few, the, the sheer numbers of them. It's in the thousands. It's not in the tens of thousands. Mm. And uh, while they're wealthy Puerto Ricans, uh, they certainly are, you know, successful entrepreneurs and wealthy Puerto Ricans. Um, it is uh, so, so. All right. So it's thirty two thousand eight hundred seventy three U.S. Um, as of uh, twenty nineteen GDP per capita. I can't tell if this is median or mean, um, but and I don't, you know, and you should adjust for uh, purchasing power, but um, it's it's significantly lower than the rest of the United States. Um, they're wealthy Puerto Ricans, and, and this is the other interesting thing, right? Uh, there are more Puerto Ricans living in the US than they are in Puerto Rico. And, and their GDP per capita, their, you know, the wealth they've created is substantially greater. So it's not some flaw in Puerto Rican, you know, mentality or the or, or work ethic or anything like that. There is a problem of work ethic in Puerto Rico, but it's funny how when they go to the U.S., their work ethic changes, right? Their productivity level increases, and they do fine. Um, so Puerto Ricans who live in Florida and Texas and in in New York, New Jersey, the huge numbers of Puerto Ricans in all of those places, Chicago, they do fine. Um, so it's something in the policies and in the incentive structure and in the educational institutions uh, of Puerto Rico uh, that is that is corrupting what is happening in Puerto Rico. So before we go into the solutions, anything else you want to say in terms of like the basic causes of the problems in Puerto Rico? I mean, fundamentally, the basic causes of um, 
government government policies. Uh, this is a place that is uh, that has strong unions, unions that are for the most part quite corrupt. Um, it's a place where politics has its hands in everything. It's a place run historically by a few wealthy families that have dominated the political class in Puerto Rico, and that have uh, and and therefore this this kind of um, cronyism creates corruption. Uh, so uh, they also somehow, uh, you know, so for example, during COVID, they hired some construction company or, or something like that to, to bring in testing equipment to, right at the beginning of the, uh, so a non-healthcare company was to, supposed to select and to bring in the health and they got a huge amount of money from the, from the Puerto Rican government. And of course, the testing equipment never showed up and when it did show up, it was useless. And it turned out that the guy who ran this company that brought in the testing equipment was the cousin or the nephew or something of, of some, the guy who was running you know, something in the government. It was all just corruption. And uh, a lot of the money that came in through FEMA and a lot of the, a lot of the equipment, for example, electrical equipment, uh, fee, uh, you know, the, the state bought a huge amount of ele new electrical equipment to replace old electrical equipment that was damaged after Maria. And um, first of all, they discovered a lot of it in warehouses, never used. Year, uh, two years later, warehouses never used, just sitting there because nobody knew it was there. Nobody knew what to do with it. Nobody knew how to install it. And then they discovered that there was uh, there was a, a a group within the electric company that was sell, that was selling this equipment overseas, out of Puerto Rico, and pocketing the money. So they were getting it from the federal government through FEMA. And then selling it elsewhere. So that kind of endemic corruption that you see in in um, in two bit kind of banana republics, if you will, that unfortunately exists in Puerto Rico, and again is a, a characteristic of government controlling everything and people, individuals having a lot of power to manipulate and to uh, to corrupt the system. All right, so let's talk about the potential what is the well actually let me ask one more thing about the problems like i'm guessing that the electricity issues are just a huge deterrent to any industry coming to puerto rico well they 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 are but it's 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 interesting again so for example i think it was in the 1950s and 60s i might be getting the dates wrong but the general principle here is this is right puerto rico decided they wanted to attract industry to the island so they, uh, they basically provided these massive tax incentives for the pharmaceutical industry to come to Puerto Rico. And you had uh, pharmaceutical industries responded to incentives and they located their big facilities in areas that had a significant, uh, closer to the power generating facilities than let's say San Juan is. So you, you go out of San Juan and you travel the island and you see these big pharmaceuticals and, and a lot of it was because they wanted stable electricity and they, therefore they wanted to be close to the power generating. They didn't want to rely on the power distribution network, which is, mm. which is pretty bad. Um, of course, at some point, they, the Puerto Rican government decided it was unfair that these uh, pharmaceutical companies weren't paying their fair share of taxes. So they did away with the tax incentive. But guess what happened? <laughs> Those pharmaceutical companies moved elsewhere. And, and part of, part of, um, the complaints that exist today about the supply chains all leading to China is that some of those pharmaceutical companies moved some of these facilities in a sense, they outsourced them to China instead of having them in Puerto Rico. But that was a response directly to the fact that Puerto Rican government increased, uh, increased taxes. Um, so, so that is a, uh, so uh, a lot of industries, heavy, heavier industries, if they're going to locate a Puerto Rico, they're going to locate to those places. But there is an issue, for example, in finance. I mean, one of the big concerns um, that that a, a financier might have in coming to Puerto Rico is how do I trade from here if the electricity goes out, right? So I can get a generator, but if the if the internet goes out, right, and internet is driven by electricity, you, you know, the internet arrives in your home to, through uh, through j repeaters that are that have to be that that, gen that has have to have some energy. Um, so a big a big consideration is uh, uh, internet electricity. There's one um, 
uh, internet service provider here that, that does a good job of providing internet service, even when power breaks down. I'm not sure exactly how they do it, but they do. Um, uh, but uh, others are not. And, and so a lot of people have multiple internet providers so that one goes out, they have other ones because they might, th these guys might have be gener might be connecting to the internet in a place where the electricity went out and these others might not, you wanna diversify. Uh, so a lot of ways around it, but they're expensive and they're, and they're ha a hassle to deal with. So yes, uh, uh, power is a problem. One other thing that we have to talk about that relates to both energy, but relates to generally, just the evil and the stupidity of government regulations. One of the real challenges that Puerto Rican faces, now it's true, uh, it, this is a problem in other places in the US and it relates, to, it relates to energy directly, is the Jones Act. And you can't talk about Puerto Rico without talking about the Jones Act. And I don't know how familiar you are with the Jones Act. It comes up a lot in energy. Yeah, it's, it's the reason why Massachusetts actually gets some of its natural gas, not from Texas, not from even uh, Maryland, Pennsylvania, but from Russia. Um, uh, so uh, the same is true of Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico imports 100% of its natural gas. It, it imports all of its gasoline, all of its energy, but it imports none of it or almost none of it from the United States. Um, there is uh, a lot of the natural gas comes from Trinidad, um, which is another Caribbean island that I guess has natural gas reserves. But some of it comes from Russia. There, there's a number of news stories here in Puerto Rico about uh, Puerto Rico buying natural gas from Siberia. And the reason is the Jones Act. So what does the Jones Act say? This is an act that was passed about 100 years ago by Congress. So this is not a Puerto Rican law. It's a U.S. federal law. Um, and the, the, the Jones Act basically states that if you're going to transport goods between two U.S. ports, it could be Houston to Puerto Rico, but it could also be Houston to Boston or Boston to Maryland or to Baltimore. Uh, any two ports, the ship has to be US built, US flagged, US owned, and a vast majority of crewmen on the ship must be US citizens. Now, this was originally passed for like most, like, like much uh, uh, government intervention in the economy, the excuse for it, particularly under Trump, the excuse for it was national security. Uh, we need a merchant marine fleet in order to transport troops to the field in World War I, to uh, you know, the, the, the theater of action in World War II. Um, so for that, we need to maintain a military marine fleet. And to do that, we have to guarantee that they have work. So to do that, we're going to mandate that th this happens. Now, it turns out that this, of course, doesn't work. A merchant marine fleet in the United States has been in massive decline over the last 100 years. And indeed, for the Gulf War, most of the ships used to transport U.S. troops to the Gulf War and U.S. equipment to the Gulf War uh, were foreign ships, foreign flagships, foreign crew ships, uh, because they just weren't enough ships. I think there's one... Um, one uh, Jones Act certified LNG ship, so just one, uh, because it just doesn't make sense. It's, it's, it's maintaining these ships, and, uh, and it's so expensive to build them in the United States. Um, there's one in the entire fleet of cruise ships in the world. There is one cruise ship that was built in the United States and flagged and everything else, and it's the most expensive uh, most maintenance, dumbest ship ever. It's, it's, it's literally it, one cruise ship is built in the U.S.? One, one, one cruise ship. And it was a disaster. And it's much more expensive than any cruise ship. So, for example, if you want to take a cruise to Alaska from California, no cruise ship, literally not a single cruise ship, will go from California to Alaska. I actually looked because, into this. Because this that would violate the Jones Act. Is that why? I was wondering. Yeah. Like, why It stops in Canada. Happen? They all stop in Canada. Now, Canada's economy relies on this. So the Canadians lobby heavily not to do away with the Jones Act. <laughs> no cruise ship will, will go from Miami to Puerto Rico without stopping in like the Bahamas or some other place because then it's a violation of the Jones Act. So now if you stop in another port, then it's okay, right? So if you go Miami, Bahamas, Puerto Rico, then you're not violating the Jones Act. So it could be a, a, a Panama flag ship, right? So, um, you know, so 
ships can go. So you can, you, there's no, there are no cruise ships that go directly from California to Hawaii, right? Except for one, which is the one U.S. Jones Act cruise ship. Um, so it's just insanity, right? It's a stupid law that has served its purpose. It maybe, maybe never had a purpose. Probably never had a purpose. And is is just, but nobody will get rid of it. And after Maria, there was an enormous pressure on the Trump administration. You know, get rid of the stupid law. This is a ridiculous law. It, it's, it, and of course, nothing happened. They they did not get rid of it. You know, keeping American jobs. The merchant marines, you know, lobbied heavily in Congress. And who's going to lobby against them? I mean, there's no natural constituency for the anti Jones Act. The Canadians lobbied aggressively. I'm sure the Bahamians. Bahamians or whatever, Bahama lobbied aggressively um, to keep it. So, and of course, this affects um, the cost of electricity, the cost of fuel in in, in Puerto Rico. We they import 100% of their fuel, and um, they import it from not from the United States, which is probably the cheapest place they could bring it in, uh, but but other places. Wow, I'm glad you mentioned that. All right, so what is the uh, what's Iran's plan to revolutionize uh, Puerto Rico? And it, I think in your talk you talked about it could be like uh, Hong Kong. Yeah, so I gave a talk. Actually, it was March of 18. I just moved to Puerto Rico, and I was asked by at a crypto uh, conference, a blockchain crypto conference, to give a talk. And I said, I don't know anything about crypto. I said, Oh no, we want you to give a talk. So, but you have to have crypto. You have to have blockchain in the title. So, so the title of my talk was. Um, how do you use free markets and blockchain to turn Puerto Rico into the Hong Kong of the Caribbean? And so, so basically I said, it's, it's relatively easy because let's just look at, let's just compare, right? Compare and contrast. What has led to prosperity in Hong Kong? Hong Kong has a GDP per capita significantly higher than the median in the United States. So it's, 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 it would be one of the richest states in the U.S. if it was a state. And it's only started generating wealth about 70 years ago. So before that, it was way poorer than anything in the US. It was one of the poorest places. On it. it basically was a fishing village. There was nothing there. So how did it get to that? Um, is it as nice? It's, I don't even think it's as nice naturally as Puerto Rico, is it? It's actually, well, I mean, Hong Kong is beautiful. I mean, oh, it's, it, is. Okay. It, it is, it is. It's, it's, uh, it's one of the most beautiful places, partially because of the skyscrapers, but also, also the background to the skyscrapers is this mountain. And so it's, it's actually Okay, so they're funny. both very beautiful yeah. places. Yeah, um, but the fundamental is that, you know, Hong Kong, so Puerto Rico, I said a third of, of the employed people in Puerto Rico work for the government. In Hong Kong, it's four or 5%. Um, so I said the first thing Puerto Rico should do is fire all its government employees um, and shift everything to the private sector. Um, Port, Hong Kong has very, very low taxes. Puerto Rico could have very, very low taxes. Hong Kong makes it very easy to start a business. It's not the best in the world at this, but it's among the top few in the world. Now, let me just caveat this. Hong Kong has changed tragically and dramatically just over the last 12 months, 18 months. Um, you know, the Chinese are basically taking over and taking over Hong Kong. The, the the last really free newspaper in Hong Kong just shut down last week, was shut down by the, by the Chinese last week. So this was before, right? This is, this is the Hong Kong I prefer to remember. Um, so almost no regulation of business. Very small safety net. Very small. There's massive redistribution of wealth in, Hong Kong, in, in Puerto Rico. A, a lot of people live on welfare. Uh, the, the, the employ the, the, um, in participation rate in employment is very low in in uh, in Puerto Rico, very high in Hong Kong. You don't work, where are you going to get the money to live off of? Um, so low taxes, low regulations, um, it, no tariffs. Uh, Hong Kong has no tariffs, basically. It's a free trade zone um, and a very, very, very small government. Um, that's all you need. Now, the it's interesting that the parallel between Hong Kong and Puerto Rico is this. Hong Kong had, has, uh, doesn't, in a sense, uh, hasn't really created its own law. It basically uses British law. Uh, it, it uses common British law. The, Hong Kong doesn't create its own law. It doesn't need to. It basically uses 
you know, pretty good American contract law, property right law, the, 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 the good things, just like, just like Hong Kong. So we have those foundations. Oh, you, said, you said, is it Puerto Rico does or? Well, Puerto Rico has U.S. law, right? Got so it. Okay, I think you said Hong right? Kong. I just got confused. They don't have to reinvent the wheel here in terms of laws. You've got, you've got right. good laws fundamentally protecting property rights and protecting contract laws. Um, you know, Hong Kong uh, didn't really control, the people didn't really control their, quote, fate in the sense that they were a colony of, of the UK before they were taken over by China and then they were a colony of China. Um, they kind of elected a, a, a political body that had very little power. Well, there's a certain similarity with Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is not a state. It's kind of a colony of the United States. Um, so, you know, may, maybe what we should do is give the people less power in terms of democratic processes in Puerto Rico. So it mimics more of Hong Kong. But my basic argument is what you need in Puerto Rico is, is free market. And at the time, this is uh, three months after, six months after Maria, there was still vast parts of the island that were out of electricity. I said, what, what needs to happen in Puerto Rico is you need to privatize the entire thing and not privatize it and regulate and control and give it to one entity, but break it up, privatize it and create some incentives for competition and deregulate it, let people innovate. And, and, and who knows what the innovation would be, right? Uh, I, my dream is to have three or four small nuclear power plants drive the whole island. I'm not even sure you need that many, but, but have, have a, because of the, the susceptibility to hurricanes, the one thing you don't want is long power grids that transport the electricity from one part of the island where electricity is produced to the other part of the island where electricity is, is consumed. And that's what happens today. The other power generating facilities are on one side of the island and the power and all the consumption is on the other side where San Juan is. You want to have local, small local power plants that actually are close to where you're consuming the power. Um, but let the market decide, right? Let, free this up, let it all happen. Um, and at the time, there was a lot of discussion about privatizing the electric grid, and it's happened, but it's happened on like the worst type of privatization, where it's not really private. It's, it's just shifting from government ownership to government control, which is very similar. Um, and, um, and, you know, and, and I had a big blockchain into it. So, so, and this would work for California as well, but it's quite stunning. I said, you know, I had just experienced trying to get a driver's license in Puerto Rico. So that was fresh. So I said, why is it that in the 21st century, we have to go to this place called the DMV to get our driver's license and stand there like idiots and get a photo, stand in line for hours and then get a photo and then wait for them to let, put, uh, you know, put it onto a card and, or maybe they mail it to you and you get it in the mail or whatever. What, you know, why can't you sit in front of your computer? Um, we've all got cameras on a computer. Um, take, take, fill out a form, take a picture of yourself send it all electronically, have it all verified on the blockchain uh, within minutes, and then have the driver's license downloaded onto your, onto your phone. Um, why do we even need a DMV? You could fire everybody to DMV. They could all get productive, actual productive jobs and actually do something uh, worthwhile. And you, know, you would have a driver's license on your, on, on your phone. There's only one country in the world that I know does that. Um, and that's Estonia. Estonia, everything is digital. Uh, there's no, there's no paper licenses. There's no paper anything. Um, so that's how I brought in blockchain into my talk. But uh, did did you? I, when we were corresponding, I forget. Did, so you said you have this idea for nuclear. Did they have they ever had nuclear plants on the island? Yes. Yeah, so the, in in the early 1960s, there was a small nuclear power plant on the uh, western part of the island um, that was uh, I forget I forget that it was a new technology. It was it was one of the few uh, nuclear power plants that was using this technology. Um, it was uh, it, it was not a very big nuclear power plant. It was relatively small. It was funny because we were driving. We, we did a J trip once, and in a, in, in a, we were driving a place, beautiful place called Rincon. I mean, this is one of the prettiest places on the island. And we're driving down to the beach, and as we're driving down, there's this massive dome thing right by the water. It's this, and I'm looking at it. You know, that really looks like a nuclear power plant, but no, I mean. 
in Rincon, you know, this is a tourist place. There's no, I've never heard of a nuclear power plant in Puerto Rico. So of course, the, the, you know, today all knowledge is accessible to you instantaneously. So we stopped the call, looked it up on Google, and there it is. This is the, this is the nuclear power plant that they had uh, in Rincon in the 1960s. Um, supposedly, and I, I've never been able to dig up any real information about this, they ran into some maintenance problems and in, uh, in the late 1960s and ultimately shut it down. And then there was a whole process of, of decommissioning it and getting rid of the, uh, getting rid of the um, radioactivity. And today it's, a, it's some kind of museum. Um, and, and hopefully my next trip to Rincon will we'll go visit the museum. But at the time when we were there it was during COVID and it was shut down. But um, so I don't know how real the maintenance problems were uh, or any of these issues uh, that they talk about, but there was a small pop, a nuclear power plant here, but it didn't last. I think it was, I think it was producing electricity for like five years and was shut down. Uh, are you familiar with Puerto Rico's electricity plans going forward? So um, there's a lot of talk about this, right? So, uh, and, and there's a lot of, uh, pull and tug going on between the federal government that, uh, that wants to impose a certain plan, the, 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 the Puerto Rican government, and now, I mean, the, 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 the publicly owned electric company and now Luma, the, the private company. And I have not dug deeply into this, but, but there is, there's basically one approach, which is what we wanna do. So a lot of the power plants in the island actually burn fuel, burn liquid fuel to produce electricity. Um, this is, I mean, you know more about this than I do, but it, from what I've read, this is relatively expensive and, uh, and relatively polluting. And uh, what they're trying to do, there's one coal power plant on the island. Right, which this is actually the subject of my hearing because they're trying and, to shut it down. And what they're instantly. trying to do, yeah, what, what my understanding is they're trying to do, because again, I, I'm not even sure where they import the coal from, again, not from the United States, but what they're trying to do and have been for years is to convert much of this into natural gas, because natural gas is, is cheaper than these other sources. And it's in Trinidad, which is not that far away, uh, is a source of natural gas, or at least Russia is, is a pretty cheap source of liquidified natural gas, bizarrely enough. Um, and, and they've been trying to do this with mixed results. Um, again, part of the big problem in, in Puerto Rico is that the power plants are far away from the central population. So the distribution is, is, is a, big, a big challenge here. Um, so, so the effort has been to move towards more natural gas. And now there's this push, and it came right after Maria. There's this push to say, why are we investing in natural gas? Yeah, we should be shutting down coal, but not to replace it with natural gas. What we should be doing and, and shutting down liquid uh, uh, fuels, what we should be doing is replacing it with wind and solar. Now there's some wind farms in Puerto Rico and I have to say right by where I live, it, it, during much of the year, there's massive amounts of winds. I mean, there's a lot of wind here. I mean, you'd think that we could put a windmill on top of the building here and, and, and cut ourselves off on the grid and we'd be, we'd be great. But the fact is that when I see the wind farms, because there are quite a few wind farms, um, windmill farms in Puerto Rico, I always drive by them. Um, and um, I, I, you know, I used to wonder about this in California because the same phenomenon in California, but here it's even worse. Half the windmills are not spinning. Um, you know, it's, it's like there's wind and the windmill you know, these windmills are not working and it seems like they break down and I don't, you probably know the stats on this more than I do, but it just always looks like they're not turning even when there is wind. So there's something about this technology that obviously doesn't work and a tiny, tiny fraction of the, of the Puerto Rican uh, electricity, what is it, 2 point something percent is, is derived from, uh, from wind and solar and so on. Solar is, is, um, you know, it's sunny here. So people immediately think sunny, it's great, right? But as you've pointed out many, many times, it's not sunny at night. Uh, and at night in Puerto Rico, you still use air conditioning. We probably use the air conditioning at night more than we do during the day because 
Uh, when you sleep, you want to have a cool environment. You sleep better in a cool environment and it never gets cold outside. So you're always trying to, and you don't open windows. I mean, one of the, one of the disadvantages of the tropics is mosquitoes. So you don't open the windows in, uh, in Puerto Rico to bring in cooler air. You put on air conditioning. So air conditioning demand is very high at night. Um, no sunshine at night. Uh, storage batteries are very expensive and technology is very primitive. Um, so, but that's the push. The push is to get them to invest in these, uh, what you call uh, unreliables. Yeah, I mean, this is, I, I agree with everything you said. I'd, I'd make it even stronger. I mean, they're talking about, so 40% of electricity from renewable resources by 2025. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's a joke. But this is like, this is this part of my theme is, I mean, Puerto Rico is an example of something that's happening around the world where people have trouble with basic, reliable electricity, sure. very significant cost problems. And then the there's this whole movement, oh, let's use these unreliables that don't work anywhere. Like, no, yep. and, and so if you look at the goals, it goes to 60% by 2040, um, and then 100% by 2050. And notice, um, Notice also it's an assistance on renewable. So no nuclear is allowed. No, of course not. In this not. in this goal. And I don't know where like you got a bunch of hydroelectric dams in Puerto Rico. Like where is this? I think there might be one, but but you're not gonna get many. I mean, there are mountains here, but it, 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 there's not a lot of rivers. There's not, you know, it's just too small of an island to do yeah, hydroelectric. So the, the hydro, the places with higher quote renewable percentages are usually places yes. with hydro. Hyd Yep. Or they burn a lot of wood. And, and California now is struggling with hydro because of drought. Right, um, right. So that's, I mean, that's less weather dependent, but still has still weather, de has weather dependent. So it's, it's just this trend where you have this, you have this place that's struggling financially, struggling in particular with electricity. And then the movement is let's mandate these forms of electricity that are guaranteed to make things worse and that are completely impossible to do. Uh, at this at this scale, and so it's and so after Maria, after the, I mean the hurricane, and it's hard to it's hard to imagine the devastation. I mean the devastation was was I mean it was brutal. It was really brutal. I mean this building again. I live I live in one of the nicest places in in Puerto Rico, right close to the tourist area. You think this would get electricity pretty quickly? It took three months to get electricity to this building. In three your months. building? In our building. So it ran off a generator only at night for those three months because there wasn't enough diesel to run it all day and all night. Plus, plus think about the wear and tear on a diesel generator to run it for three months. It's not built for that. It's built for, right. for emergencies. And uh, so our building was out of electricity for three months. Uh, so were many other luxury, you know, this is the best areas, right? So you can only imagine what the conditions were for, you know, for, for poor communities, for poor parts of the city. Uh, it, it's horrific. Anyway, after Maria, Elon Musk stepped in and said, I will solve the problem. I will guarantee you that there will never be another problem like this. I will bring in solar energy onto the island. We'll create these uh, local fa uh, solar farms. So there'll be local grids. You won't have to transport. Because the big part of what happened was because the electricity facilities on the other side of the island and the mountains in between, the, the power lines over the mountains got annihilated by the storm, partially because they're badly built, but partially because it was a category five hurricane. And, you know, category five hurricanes are, you know, very little of uh, infrastructure is built very, you know, we saw what happened even in New Orleans and other places when a category five hurricane hits, a lot of even good infrastructure gets gets uh, pummeled. But here it wasn't good. It was it was it was decrepit. Anyway, he said, we'll be local. We'll put it all over the place. I've got the battery technology. We, we've solved the problem. We'll have it done. There was a lot of hype around this and a lot of newspaper articles about in the months after. And then slowly it fizzled out and, and you just stopped hearing about it and it just went away and it just never happened. And of course, I'm sure some people say, oh, it was because of government bureaucracy and whatever and the power interests and the, the local power uh, company probably didn't want the competition or whatever. And maybe some of that is true, but much more likely is that the technology just doesn't yeah, work. There's nowhere. I mean, it's, it's, it's done nowhere. So it doesn't no. exist anywhere, no. except yeah. you know, it just keeps making these 
And there's a little the island off the coast of Puerto Rico called Vieques, a beautiful island, um, beautiful little island with some gorgeous beaches. It's it's an amazing island, and it got it it got the full brunt of the hurricane. And it, you know, I, I remember staying there at like a five star resort, the W Vieques Island, and the W was destroyed during the the the, the Category Five it, it, during Maria it was literally obliterated. And it still hasn't opened to this day. Anyway, uh, this island, they were going to say, okay, we'll just do solar energy on this tiny little island that has a population of a few thousand people. That should be easy, right? It's it's a it's a small place. Never happened. Uh, you know, it 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 it's just these are these are fantasies, and and people keep generating the fantasies and still continuously believing in the fantasies. And, uh, you know, when you ask them to show reality, to, to point to something, they can't. There's, there's just zero evidence because it's, it's not doable. It is a fantasy. I mean, one, one final thought is particularly where you have these situations where you've got these weather challenges, like you really want freedom and the, in using the best stuff. So it's a really bad thing to have these hazards and then to just have all these crackpot ideas and then government bureaucrats and corruption because you're just never going to get anything good. I mean, absolutely. And, and, uh, and here again, the, the solution to with the category five, how we can is not to put, not to have to have run electricity over the mountains uh, or to, or to figure out how to, you know, put in, put it underground or to figure out how to build. I mean, does know, anyone talk about just having natural gas plants near the city centers. So that's so that is what they're trying to convert some of the uh, power plants that are on near the city. But it, it's going to take a while. They have to build new power plants, and nobody's talking about building new power plants, right? I mean, they're talking about converting old ones from one form of energy to another. But but yes, of course, that is the solution. That was the solution that was talked at from Maria. We need distributed networks, not of not of solar, but 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 of of, of natural gas. It's cheap. It's clean, um, and uh, and it's 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 easy, and they, they have the they have the LNG ports right because they already import natural gas. So LNG is already part of the infrastructure. Uh, it's just a matter of doing it in the right places. But for that, you need a market. You need competition. You need somebody who knows that they can produce energy cheaply close to the city center. Wow, what a profit opportunity. I can produce it much cheaper than the guy who's producing it on the other side of the island and who's shipping it over through cables who might get destroyed. I can offer it right here. Um, but that, that, and that requires, of course, land use regulations that, that allow for that kind of thing. And we know, we know all over the United States that not in my backyard, it, it, it's becoming more and more difficult to build any kind of power plant. Uh, one of the reasons California imports so much of its electricity is because they won't build power plants in California because of the not in my backyard uh, mentality. So, so then you get to have to deal with inefficient grids. And then you've got all these issues about buying and selling electricity and, and everything that happened that has happened over the last few decades with electricity. But a, a big part of that problem is just where you're locating the, you know, locating the, the, the power plants. The, the whole distribution issue would not be an issue if you didn't have not in my backyard uh, questions. Oh man, well, hopefully we can inspire some change on this. Uh, any anything else? Let's just let's just go broader. What what are you working on these days that listeners might be interested in? And also just remind them where they can find you. Well, I mean, I'm I'm doing a I'm doing a lot of shows uh, on the Iran Book Show, uh, so I'm um, you know probably do three four shows a week, uh, sometimes three, but usually four shows a week. So it's a lot of content being generated. You can find that on YouTube. Um, I'm doing a lot of debates, uh, Zoom debates. Uh, I, I'm doing one a week for uh, for the Ayn Rand Center in uh, in the UK. Um, I've also debated uh, all kinds of leftists who are interested in debating, uh, including Vosh recently, which was a crazy debate. Supposedly, I'm, I'm uh, lined up. I, oh, I'm lined up to debate, um, and I'm, I'm dreading this, but I'm lined up to debate Richard Wolff this Marxist uh, economics uh, professor mm. at the University of Pennsylvania in October. Uh, I mean, he's a real piece of work, this guy. So I'm doing tons and a lot of debates. Um, uh, and then I, you know, recently I launched with a couple of, a uh, couple of uh, friends, Don Watkins being one of them and, and my business partner, Robert Hendershot, 
this project about human progress, uh, to, and more on the economic than on the philosophical side, because that's where my business partner is coming from, uh, called the, uh, Ingenuism. You can find that on ingenuism.substack.com, and we've launched a YouTube channel. I just interviewed um, Deirdre McCloskey, who's who's a really interesting economist who I, I really like, um, in spite of the fact that we disagree on a lot of things, but she's really interesting. Um, I just interviewed... Uh, uh, Tyler Cowan, and that interview will go up in a couple of weeks. I interviewed uh, Scott, uh, <laughs> I can't pronounce his name, um, Lincecum, Lincecum. Uh, I know who's you're a, talking about, yeah, I've never actually pronounced his Scott name. Scott Lincecum is, 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 he's one of the better writers on economic and legal and, and economic issues out there right now. He writes for Cato and he writes for The Dispatch. Uh, so I interviewed him and I've got a whole line of people uh, that I'd like to interview. Don has interviewed some people, so um, so that's a that's a project that's that's focused kind of the on the economics of progress and what it takes and why why progress happens sometimes and doesn't happen other times in some places and on others. It's similar to the Hong Kong Puerto Rico um, example. I mean, part of the challenge, of course, is with any of this is we I think we know this stuff, right? It's so that so the knowledge necessary to create economic progress, the knowledge necessary to provide cheap, clean energy is known. It, it, there's no mystery about it. You just need eyes and, and you just need to point people and you can point, we can point to all the fabulous examples that exist out there of how it works. Hong Kong being one of my favorite. Um, and I'm not sure how Hong Kong produced electricity. That would be interesting given the amount of electricity they probably needed mm -hmm. um, for that economic growth. It would be interesting to figure out how they produce their energy. but. Um, all that is known and, and, and people, people live in a, in a certain fantasy world, a mystical, uh, detached from reality fantasy world that, that they want to believe in. It's why socialism is still popular. It's, it's, a, it's a fantasy, it's detached from any reality. And it'll work next time. Solar hasn't worked anywhere, never has, but it'll work. Next. I, I don't know if I ever told you, but in 1978, I wrote a school paper. My one of my high school classes required us to write a school paper, and I went, I went to the Israel Institute of Technology and interviewed scientists and engineers. And the theme of the school paper was, was solar energy and how solar energy was going to revolutionize the world. And it, it was just on the brink in 1978. It was on the brink of of revolutionizing everything, and it was, and I interviewed scientists who said that, and engineers who were convinced of it, and and. Uh, and, and Israel uses a lot of solar energy because we use it to heat um, hot water. So we don't have uh, all our hot water in Israel. You see these tanks, these ugly tanks on the, on the, on, on the buildings. Those are solar, solar panel warmed and they've had this forever. And for that, it probably makes sense, uh, particularly when electricity in other forms is, is expensive. Um, uh, but, um, but yeah, since 1978, people have had this fantasy they, they, they still live it. They, they choose to reject the obvious facts about it. Um, and it's, it's what we're fighting against. Uh, I and mean, there's a lot to say about that but with, with, yep. you know, with the energy, I think one point that's powerful is when people understand that all the successful forms of energy are highly concentrated and they get this idea that a lot of success is having a lot of energy in a small amount of space and a small amount of weight. It's particularly obvious for transportation because then they start realizing, oh, wow, you know, oil is really cool. Like even if they don't like it 100%, it's like, oh, wow, it's it's amazing. It's an amazing strength to weight ratio. And then you get, oh, nuclear has yeah, even more. Exactly. And, then you, and then you also get the idea it's naturally stored. So like yep. being naturally concentrated, naturally stored, like that's such an advantage versus, oh, it's naturally dilute. And it's naturally intermittent. It's like you, then you start to see, oh yeah, that would be a total pain in the ass. And then then you have to unnaturally concentrate, concentrate and store it, and that turns out to be really expensive. So I think like, it, there has to be some. They have a positive association, so at least you need some positive association. With yeah. So you need stuff. you have a lot of great ways of of taking this issue and explaining it and concretizing it in ways that uh, that make it real for people. And, and then make it real visceral for people so that they, they understand that one is a fantasy and, and the other is a reality. And, it, and, and it's a reason there's a, it's a reality because there's some metaphysical characteristics 
that relate to it that uh, that um, and what we need is is to do that for every aspect of uh, of human life in a sense because because they 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 have these kind of they're delusional about almost everything not just about well, it yeah with um so I have this new I have this energy talking points things for elected officials and I'm having a new one called energy champions for kind of energy and advocates of energy mm -hmm. but the concept I can share with you once I do the talk but like it's basically like I think there are five or six ty types of like highly retainable content that you need for any field and so mm -hmm. one of them is like um, having really essentialized causal explanations of yes. the thing. So it's like, you know, nature doesn't give us a safe climate. We make dangerous, it gives us a dangerous climate that we make safe, like those kinds of things. And like, I think for every field, you need those. And then yes. you need really Great. efficient ways of communicating like what your positive vision is. It's like, I don't want to save the planet from human beings. I want to improve the planet for human beings, like that type of thing. And then you need like a positive and they're all like highly retainable. You need that for a policy uh, as well. So it, it would, I don't, I'm trying to think of a good one off the top of my head, but like, you know, I don't want to, you, know, you know, I don't want to mandate certain types of energy. I want to liberate all forms of energy or yep. something like that, like where they can get that. And then you want like examples that are very like, like stories that are very uh, quick, like, you know, I mean, something like, you know, in, um, what is it like there's one at Tanzania where you know thanks to uh oil derived fuel like two million whatever it is I don't have I, I'm missing this, but like two million girls a day now don't have to carry water yeah. uh, around the place like those yeah. kinds of things and then you need the facts like the essentialized facts like in Germany you know going to 37 percent solar and wind in the last 20 years their electricity prices have doubled or like in the U.S. our electricity prices have gone up even though natural gas prices have plummeted why? Because we're adding solar and wind. Or, yep. And like when you have that whole infrastructure of the positive vision, the positive policy, the causal generalizations, the power facts uh, and the stories. And then also you always have re you change the terminology, like not renewables, but unreliables. Then you you create this whole um, it allows you to just create this new the fully like fleshed out framework for people to have. And then they can start speaking your language and then and then you can you can uh, on a regular you can create a mental environment for them where they're seeing everything fit into that and all the stories like you tell the stories oh here's green energy is failing here and in england you know people are burning old library book uh, old books which is literally happening you know because of the cold or these people like froze to death or people are sitting in buses all day or people are saying right. yeah. and it's like it's like you have to give this whole alternate uh, true portrayal of the way the world works with all those essentialized elements, all of which are retainable. So I think that that's like, uh, I'm working on getting other energy people to build it out for energy, but I think it's the exact same thing for every other field. Yeah, I think, yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, part of what we're trying to do with kind of the idea of progress is to do the same thing for that, you yeah. know, for, for, for progress yeah, more broadly um, in terms of, uh, in terms of exactly the same. And there's a lot to study there. I mean, uh, as you know, just when you when you you know you first approach a topic, there's a lot to unpack it, unpack and to figure out what what exactly is going on. It seems like oh, progress is easy. Freedom generates progress. Well, yes, but uh, there's you have to unpack that, and there's a lot there. There's a lot there. Why why is freedom working in, in one way in Silicon Valley and in a different way in 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 Miami? You know, it's not it doesn't work in the same way. Uh, so yeah. And then the policies also have to be part of the policies is just having them specific enough where they're actionable, where exactly. if somebody wanted to do it, they yep. could do it. And often it's at level two abstract. So just like, okay, let's have freedom here. And they're like, okay, but uh, what bill do I write? Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. Okay. So we've got your, just so people know you're on Brooke's show, so they can find that on YouTube and then Ingenuism, which is I N what is it? I N G U N U I S M. Yes. Yes. That's Ingenuism. It's and Substack. Uh, it's a Substack and it's a YouTube channel right now, only two videos, but we'll, we'll be generating a lot more content in the weeks and months to come. And, you know, if you're just unsure, just put your own book into Google and there aren't too many of you. <laughs> no, there's only one. There's only one your own book in the world. Um, awesome. Thanks, Yaron. Good to talk sure, to you. Always a pleasure, Alex. Good.
Thanks again to Yaron Brook for joining me. I really appreciate it because he was able to join me on really short notice and talking through the issues with him really helped my testimony about Puerto Rico, which as of now, I'm a day, I'm recording this a day after that has been a really a big success. I talk about it a bit at the end of the Chris Wright episode, so I won't repeat that here, but thanks a lot, Yaron, for, for your insight and your help and for doing it on such short notice. All right, well, let's do the usual wrap-ups. If you have any questions, comments, love mail or hate mail, email me at alex at alexepstein.com. Sign up for our mailing list at alexepsteinlist.com or industrialprogress.com. And also you can do it at energytalkingpoints.com, which you should go to anyway and share with a lot of other people because it's got a lot of really great uh, talking points there that are true and are concise and are powerful. Let's see, anything else I am missing? So uh, this is a bonus episode. So sometimes this will happen, but regular, you know, a regular interval, at least for the foreseeable future, is every two weeks. And also I should mention, particularly if you liked what was going on with my, my testimony, uh, research and development, promotional efforts, a lot of those are helped by our accelerators. So if you wanna become an accelerator or you know, up your contribution as an accelerator, go to industrialprogress.com slash accelerate, right? That is it for this week. I'll be back uh, next time with Dr. Saifedean Amos. Until then, I'm Alex Epstein. This has been Power Hour. Power Hour. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of energy. Power Hour, the antidote to shallow thinking about energy issues.